Power for Living with Bishop Dale C. Bronner. Here's the sixth definition of wow. Going beyond normal or conventional bounds. Going beyond normal or conventional bounds. Here's a spiritual parallel. Demonically inspired. Lack of balance and temperance. Pushing everything to excess. When you say, boy, that child is just wow. 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 There's some people that are just wow. They just got a wild nature. They're just some people's in, in their sexual behavior. They're just, they, they're wild. There's no other way to describe it. I know that you're saved and sanctified and you don't want to talk about this. But they're just, just, just wild. Unrestrained. No boundary. Lack of temper. Pushing everything to excess. You all know the person. Touch your neighbor and say, I know that person. <laughs> that are just wild just, just everything is in excess just wow some people are so adventurous they, they, they just push the envelope they push the envelope I was looking at a video clip of a, a, a young man he, he's bun, bungee jumping off of a building and the folks who measured the bungee cord didn't realize that the building didn't have a 13th floor. So they were on the 14th floor on the roof of the building and they measured it a story too short. They made it longer than what it was because even though it, the elevator button said 14, there were only 13 floors. So it was too long. And when he jumped off to bungee jump, he hit the ground. He was wild pushing it to the limits but he didn't make it and there are a lot of times that you don't recover because wildness will have you on the edge of doing dangerous things that have no consideration for your safety and there is no purpose in it if you died for purpose that's one thing but when you die and there is no purpose in the death oh that's that's another death Here's the seventh definition of wild. Loose from restraint or regulation. Loose from restraint or regulation. And here's a spiritual parallel. It's people who have no vision. Proverbs chapter 29 verse 18, where there is no vision or no open revelation, the people cast off restraints. They go wild. Whenever you see wild people, you'll immediately know they have no vision from God. They are not walking according to their vision. They are not walking according to their vision. Now, one reason that Pyram exists is because people are untamed and undisciplined in their spirits. I mean, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17 states this, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. So one of the reasons that we fail to walk in the spirit as we should is because we've confused walking in the spirit with doing church stuff. You're walking in the spirit every time that you discipline your children, every time you go to work on time. Every time that you pay your bills on time, every time that you do what God has told you to do, you're actually walking in the Spirit. But King Pyram is nothing more than your carnal mind. That is the carnal mind. He's the wild donkey, always wanting to, re to rebel. He's the wild donkey. He's the carnal mind. Pyram rules in us because we have not met most of our basic needs of our human personality. People who are wild are missing something, and they're wild because they're looking for something that they're missing. Remember that to be whole means nothing broken, nothing missing. Nothing broken, nothing missing. Now, I want you to look at some basic needs of the human personality, these three major basic needs of the human personality. Number one is the need to be loved unconditionally, the need to be loved unconditionally. What that provides for us is security. God loved Jesus before Jesus ever preached one message or before he healed him. God loved him and approved him. 
You remember there was a voice from heaven that spoke and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God loved him before he ever even did anything in ministry. You don't base your love on your children based on their performance. Please don't ever do that to your children. Don't love your children because they bring home good grades. Don't uh, love your children because they always clean the house and they always clean the kitchen because they do this. And you uh, equate their love with performance. Their love is an unconditional love that a parent ought to have for a child. You love them because that's your child. You don't feed them because they've done all the right things. Even when they've done the wrong thing, you still cook dinner. And so that's unconditional love. That's, that's nothing that is more securing to a human being than for them to know that they are accepted in the beloved, mistakes and all, jacked up and all, rebellious and all, that you still love them. They can hurt your heart, break your heart, borrow money from you, never pay it back, but you still love them. Tell you they're going to do something and they won't do it. Tell you that they'll never do something again and they do it again and you still have to love them. Anybody know what I'm talking about? How you have to love folks unconditionally? You have to let them know you are my child. If you go to jail, baby, if you steal something, you steal mama's boo. That's still your child. That's still your child. I sat on a murder trial, and the man who had murdered two people, and I gave him a double life sentence, but he'd murdered two people. I'm for real. <laughs> and, uh, but his mama came in, I, and, and my heart went out when mama got on the witness stand. And, and she said, he's a good child. That's my baby. He's a good child. He always ain't giving me a day of trouble. Tell that to his dead wife and the man that he killed. Tell it to that parent, to two sets of parents who are missing their children. And, and, and her heart, even though her son had murdered two individuals, this mother is on the witness stand expressing her love for her child unconditioned. She was doing what she was supposed to do as a mother. And that was something that was securing that baby, even if I have to come on death row to let you know that you are still my child, I still love you, I birthed you, I'm still praying for you, I still love you. Even though you didn't do the right thing, I still love you, I got your back. That's unconditional love. When you have messed up, if human beings can do that, how much more is the incomprehensible love of God that when we have messed up time and time and time again and we've displeased God and we've been inconsistent, we went back on our word and God loved us anyhow. We have displeased him, open rebellion against God, disobeying his word, living in sin, shacking, doing all kinds of things against the nature of his word and God God still says, I love you. While we were yet sinners, he died for us because he was in love with us. Forever married to the backslider, making wrong choices at the wrong time with the wrong people. And God said, I still love you. I love you and you and you. I love the big bone one. I love the one with freckles and the one with an acne problem. I love that one. I love the one whose teeth are jacked up. I love the one that's got a skin rash up their legs and, and whose feet are messed up. I love that one. I love the one who can't grow hair. I love that one. I love the one with piercings. I love the one with tattoos tatted up the front and down the back. I love them. I love them. I love them who have got orange hair, purple hair, burgundy hair. I love you. I love you. I love It is the love of the Father unconditionally, not based on anything that you did, not because you went out witnessing, not because you got up early in the morning to pray. It wasn't because you've been reading your word all day. God says, I love you because you are mine. And we love him simply because he first loved us, not because of the house that he blessed us with, not because of the car, not because of the job, not because we got the loan approved. We love him because he first loved us. It is the most securing thing that you could ever have is the unconditional love of God. There's a need in every human being to be loved unconditionally. Number two, we have a need to be valued. That deals with self-worth. The first step with security. The second one deals with self-worth. We have a need to be needed. 
a need to be needed. And that's why God gives us something of worth and value. There is a value that is in your life. You might have to dig for it, but there is a value that is in your life. God has placed great value in your life. It's not always on the surface. Most of the time you have to dig for it. You will never know the talents that are in people right around you if they didn't tell you. You can't look at a person and tell what kind of gift they have in them. You don't know what kind of, a, you can't look at a person and tell when they can sing. Some people have fooled me. I mean, some people come up to me and I'll, and I'll tell them, I say, you know what, you built like you can sing. And then you know what they tell me? They said, I can't sing a note. I can't carry a tune in a bucket. You can't look at people and tell what they're capable of. You can't, you know, you have no idea whether a person has an artistic gift by looking at them. You can't tell a musician just by looking at them. They don't have a certain look. Well, some of them do. <laughs> but you will honestly be surprised. You can't look at people and size them up and tell what they are and what they do for a living. You don't know what kind of gift might be all around you, and folks can't look at you and tell what you're capable of. You can't look at a person and tell when they can throw down in the kitchen. You just, you just really don't know. But there's something of worth and value. We have a need to be valued, to be able to provide something that is meaningful to others. So while others might not be able to do everything that I do, I can't do what others can do. And I need that gift. I need their gift. I honor their gift. I respect their gift. I value their gift. Even the people who collect the garbage at your house, if you ever stop valuing them and the service stop picking up your trash, you don't realize how valuable that service is. Listen, everybody's not designed to be a CEO and to have their own business. Otherwise, when you go to a restaurant, who's going to serve you? You go to a hotel, who's going to clean your room? Everybody has a gift of value. And let me just tell you this, God doesn't create not one person. He doesn't allow one person to come into this earth who has no value. Did you know that the Bible Jesus taught, he said that the person who calls a person raka will be in danger of hellfire. You know what that word means? Good for nothing, worthless individual. God said, how dare you? call a human being that I have made worthless just because you don't understand their value and see their worth. How dare you call them worthless? He says, if you do that, you're in danger of hellfire. Now, I don't know what, that, that's awful strong judgment. That is some strong judgment. I think that it speaks of how wonderfully God believes in us in the giftedness that is in us, in the creativity that is in us, in the worth and the value that is in us. God has something of value. Not only does he love you unconditionally, God values you. Don't you realize that he said, I meant that he cares for the lily of the field and the birds of the air. How much more does the heavenly father care for you? If he'll take care of them, how much more? How much more valuable? I mean, he knows the number of hairs on your head. Why would he take the time to know that if you were not of value to him? Why would God even listen to you if you had no value? When you listen to a person, you affirm their value. You say to them, you are worth something or else I would not even give you the time of day. Have you seen people that just treat you so rudely there like you don't have anything to say? Or you're in a conversation and you're talking and you can tell that people are just blowing you off, that they're not even paying attention to you. They devalue you when they do that. So we want to be able to let people know, make sure that you value your children. You help to show them the value that is in their life. Help to show them the value that is in their life. Point to those things and speak toward those things. See the value. Look for the value. Here's, 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 here's a, a word to the wise. If you go in a place loaded with dirt like a gold mine, you're not going in looking for dirt. You're going in looking for gold. If you look for the gold, you'll find the gold. If you look for the dirt, that's all you'll see is the dirt. And you'll never discover the rich deposits of the gold, of the platinum, 
of the silver, of the jasper, the rubies, the diamonds, you will never find it. If you ever saw a diamond in the rough, I wish that I could have brought a hunk. I've seen diamond in the rough. It doesn't even look like diamond. You wouldn't even recognize it as a precious gem. Being in the rough, all scuffed up, it doesn't sparkle. It doesn't have the clarity. If you saw it in the rough, you wouldn't even recognize it as something of value. But every human being has a need to be valued. We have a need to be valued. We have a need in us to be loved, which produces security. Unconditional love provides security for us. And when you are valued, it provides self-worth. Self-worth. The third thing is to make a meaningful contribution to God's world. That deals with significance. Everybody wants to feel significant in this world to somebody. You need to have significance. You need security, self-worth, and significance to make a meaningful contribution to God's world. A meaningful contribution that there's a gift that is in your life there is something in you so that you can make a meaningful contribution to God's world you need to ask yourself this question how do I want to be remembered that's the starting point how do I want to be remembered that's the starting point for the meaningful contribution that you can make to the world and human beings can only function effectively to the degree that these needs are met the real need for security and for self-worth and significance, may I say this to you, can only fully be met through a close and ongoing relationship with Jesus Christ. If you look for a two-legged human being to be able to always affirm you and give you the unconditional love and the self-worth and the significance, you will be grossly disappointed. Uh, there's a part of this that God reserved for himself so that he communicates to you, you are the apple of my eye. And nobody else, I mean, when you have messed up, when you're feeling down on yourself, you are discouraged, you are disappointed, you are disillusioned, and you feel like the whole world is caving in on you and you want to kill yourself. And God looks down and sees you in that lethargic condition having mercy on you and his heart is moved with empathetic compassion toward you his heart breaks when he sees us in a condition to where we don't even realize our worth he's like here is a poor man rejecting his riches and he sees it in us and he wants to convey it to us that you are valuable to me, that I love you unconditionally. My love for you is not based on how many souls you bring in the kingdom. I'm going to love you if you didn't bring any into the kingdom. He secures us with his unconditional love. He lets us know of our self-worth by the gifts that he has given unto us. And he gives us significance by giving us a purpose i know the plans that i have for you declares the lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you hope and a future that god says you are vital in the economy of things i made you so unique that nobody else can do what i have ordained for you to do in the earth I've put you here and brought you into the kingdom for such a time as this. I put you around unsafe folks on your job for a reason. I am the one who let beater, beaten and battered people be put in your path. And I let you go through abuse and neglect earlier in your life, preparing you to have ministry in you, to minister to other people that have been broken. God says, I, I, I let you be broken because the broken become masters at mending. You didn't understand why you had to go through what you went through, but you had to go through some disturbing stuff so that you would know the God of all comfort 
and that you would be able to give the consolation that he brought you because you thought that when somebody left you and when somebody died, your whole world was collapsing on you and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all tribulation and trouble that same God now has ministry in you to be able to make you significant in the world. And the very thing that you thought was your curse, it was the staff that Pharaoh gave to you when he put you out of Egypt. And now Moses uses that to lead an entire nation and to divide a Red Sea. You don't even realize that your trouble is your promotion. You are not what you have been through, but God will use what you have been through to help deliver somebody else. It was not in vain. God had a plan in mind. He was preparing you. You were in the school of hard knocks, enrolled, matriculating uh, for a master's at the University of Adversity. And God was qualifying you and you were grumbling because the classes were keeping you up at night. And you didn't understand why you had to go through what you went through as a young person coming up and had to deal with people that treated you like you were nothing and abused you and devalued you. And why did you have to marry somebody and fall in love with somebody that wouldn't support you, that didn't believe in you, that cheated on you, that betrayed you? Why? Why? Why, God? Maybe God was just maturing something on the inside of you. Why? Why did you have to go through what you went through? Maybe so that you would deal with that pyram, that wild nature on the inside of you, the wild donkey that says nobody deals with me. Maybe, just maybe God will give you a compassion now to be able to look in somebody else and without them ever opening their mouth to explain to you what all they've been through. You know that look of abuse when you see it in somebody else's eyes when you have been down that road yourself. Somebody who doesn't even have the boldness to open their mouth and tell you that they have been molested, but when you've been molested, you know that look. You know what it does to your personality. You know what it does to your eating habits. You understand the psychology of it. And somehow, without their even having to explain the condition to you, you recognize, I've been there. And I beat it, and so can you. You have become, become a glimmer of hope for somebody else that has been through some things that you couldn't explain and didn't understand. But God is faithful and he will give you the strength and the wisdom and if he has to make the sun stand still God says I'll give you enough light to see your situation to understand this thing because God says I want you to kill this because there's a good place that I'm trying to bring you and if you come into this place and you are still dealing with a wild donkey in your mind it'll bring you down and God says I'll turn keep the light on for you and let you fight until your enemy is destroyed because I am going to bring you into a good land and no weapon formed against you is going to prosper in Jesus' name. I hope you're getting something out of the Word of God. I'm telling you, the best is yet to come, though I wish I could skip over to it. But I, I'm just savoring it. You know, every, every morsel, every part that I'm able to chew, I, I, I'm just, I, I just savor it. And I'm so grateful to God for who he is and for what he means to us. He's an, he's an awesome, awesome God. I'm glad you have an appetite for the soul food that we're serving. Thank you for watching Power for Living with Bishop Dale C. Bronner. Until next time, God bless you.